Okay, so we're starting up chapter 27, which is the animal chapter. I think many of you are like, yes, we got animals, I like animals, that's where I wanted to be this whole time, but this might not be animals the way you think of animals. Uh, but we'll cover like what makes something an animal and animal diversity, including invertebrates and vertebrates. If it'll click, there it goes. So um, as far as what makes an animal an animal, um, first of all, animals are eukaryotic. They're in the supergroup Uniconta and the clade Opisthoconta. If you remember, Uniconta also had um, fungi as well as animals and then some protists as well um, and the uh, amoebozoans. Um, so animals are multicellular. Their cells exist in an extracellular matrix. So there's stuff outside of the cell as well as the material in the cell. Um, animals may have specialized tissue or sensory, stru sensory structures like a nervous system and a muscle system for movement. Um, they have unique cell junctions. If you remember, gap junctions, tight junctions, and anchoring junctions or desmosomes. Um, maybe from 160, you talked about those. So gap junctions allow ions to cross between them. Um, tight junctions prevent the flow of material between the cells. And then anchoring junctions... Um, <laughs> this is pretty straightforward. They're um, structurally strong. They like spot weld the cells together, so they anchor them together. Um, another word for tight junctions is also occluding junctions, so you may have heard of that before. That brings us to animals being heterotrophic, meaning um, they cannot make their own food. They ingest their food and digest it internally. They have all different kinds of feeding patterns, though, like suspension feeding or bulk feeding or fluid feeding. Animals do not have a cell wall, and animals do sexual reproduction. So as far as the kinds of animals we're going to talk about, um, I've crossed off the ones that you don't need to memorize, but we will talk about all of the ones that are not crossed off. So the periphera, cnidarians, echinodermata, chordata, platyhelminthes, mollusks, annelids, nematodes, and arthropods. And we'll also talk about um, these other terms like metazoa, eumetazoa, deuterostomia, bilatera, locotrophozoa, and echidzozoa. So we will go over all of those terms. So just like I was saying before, you know, when we're like, oh yes, animals, I love animals. Um, maybe you don't love them in this way, but we're going to learn about it. And maybe you do, and if you do, that's awesome, because this will be fun for you then. As far as animal classification goes, traditionally we base classification just on morphological structures, so like what organisms look like and then their developmental features. Um, so things like the presence or absence of different tissue types or their body symmetry or even what they look like during embryonic development. Um, but more modern classification is based on molecular techniques like similarities in DNA and ribosomal RNA, in particular um, the small ribosomal subunit. So, so there's some reclassification that's occurred because of our more modern techniques. As far as animal tissues go, um, sponges fall into a group called parazoa. Para means beside, um, so they're like, I mean technically they are animals, but they're beside the animals is what they're root words are actually seen. Um, the phylum that sponges fall into is called periphera, and these do not have true tissues. However, all of the other animals which fall into the eumetazoa, eu is true, so the true animals, um, they have more than one type of tissue, um, and tissue is necessary to produce different organs and then organ systems. So the four animal tissues include connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Connective tissue is a really big group and includes things like, if you've ever taken anatomy class, maybe you've heard of like dense regular connective tissue, dense irregular connective tissue, aerial or tissue, um, blood is a connective tissue, bone is a connective tissue. Epithelial tissue is your covering and lining type tissue, um, and then there's different kinds of muscle tissue, and then nervous tissue sends electrical impulses. As far as symmetry goes, um, the eumetazoans are radially symmetrical or bilaterally symmetrical. Um, so that means the sponges that fall into periphera, um, those are asymmetrical. But radially symmetrical organisms um, basically are a circle that you can cut in half at any point and they more or less are the same on either side. Um, so these organisms have an oral and arboreal side, so they have a mouth side and a back side. And then they're diploblastic, meaning um, dies too, right? So they have two germ layers. When I say germ layer, I mean the layer of tissue that um, creates other tissues. So they have an inner 
tissue layer called their endoderm and an outer layer called their ectoderm because endo is in, right, ecto, outside. Um, organisms that are bilaterally symmetrical um, can be divided more or less um, in half along a vertical plane. Um, they have cephalization, meaning they have their special sense organs at the anterior end of their bodies, meaning they have a head, right? Like our special sense organs, we've got smell, taste, hearing, sight, those are special senses. Where are all of those located? Here on our um, anterior end here um, in our head. They also have dorsal and ventral sides. Um, your dorsal side is your, on us, it's our back side. If you think of a shark, right, their, you know, uh, dorsal fin sticks out of the water there. Um, and then ventral side is the belly side. Um, they also have anterior and posterior. Anterior is the front and posterior is the back. Um, so on our organism here, Right, you've got anterior in the front, posterior in the back, um, dorsal is this back side, and ventral is the belly side. Um, and then bilateral organisms are triploblastic, meaning they have three germ layers. They have the endoderm, the inside layer, they have the ectoderm, the outside layer, and then they have the mesoderm in between that, the middle layer. So let's match the um, animal to the type of symmetry, whether they're asymmetrical, bilateral, or have radial symmetry, and then determine if it falls into eumetazoa or parazoa. So the first one, it's a little bit tricky to tell, but that's a sponge. Um, it's kind of circular, but is it perfectly circular? No, so that is gonna be um, asymmetrical, and then is it eumetazoa or parazoa? It is parazoa. So the first one is asymmetry, asymmetry, <laughs> and parazoa. The second one here, we have kind of like a jellyfish. Um, they're showing you nicely here that we can divide it basically any way in half. So that is radially symmetrical, um, and it is eumetazoa. This last one, bilaterally symmetrical, eumetazoa. That brings us into protostomes and deuterostomes. Um, Basically, the super short story on development, right, you have the sperm, you have the egg, they get together, um, you have a single cell, that cell divides a whole bunch, and then you get this ball of cells, and then that ball of cells gets an opening, and then you get kind of complicated folding that occurs, and then you get an organism, right? That's totally the short story, um, but that first opening is called the blastopore. Um, and in protostomes, that becomes the mouth. Um, they also have spiral cleavage and um, determinant cleavage in their cell division. The cleavage is talking about like going from one cell to the next cell and so on and so forth. In deuterostomes, that first opening becomes the anus and they have radial cleavage and indeterminate cleavage. So they have pluripotent stem cells um, and this includes echinodermata, which is things like a starfish um, or a sea cucumber and also chordata, which includes us. A very juvenile way that I remember this is I think deuterostomes, right? And then I think doo doo, and then I think anus. So if that helps you at all, go ahead. If it doesn't help you, then find your own memory trick, right? So that brings us to the coelom. A coelom is a body cavity um, that's located between the intestinal canal and the body wall. Previously, we would say, oh, this has a coelom, this doesn't have a coelom, this has a pseudo coelom, something like that. We would say that to construct animal phylogeny or trying to determine who was related to who, but we now think that is really kind of an unreliable um, metric because it could have come about more than one time evolutionarily or it may have been lost um, during evolutionary history. So maybe not such a good determinant for evolutionary history, but I'm introducing you to this terminology because you may run into it later. Um, so an organism that is a coelomate has no um, body cavity between the intestinal canal and body wall that is going to be packed solid with mesoderm, which is that middle layer tissue. A pseudocelomate has a body cavity, but it's incompletely lined with mesoderm. And then a eucelomate, U is true, right? Pseudo is false. So a eucelomate has a true coelom. Um, so it has a body cavity that's completely lined with mesoderm. Um, 
So it would have mesentery to support the internal organs, our body movements, we have this, our body movements are more free because our outer wall of our body can move more independently of our organs and our organs have more space to become more complex. So let's look at our pictures here. For number three, it says which series of images represents protostomes. Again, the easiest thing to look at is that first opening, which I think the easiest thing to look at is the first opening, so that blastopore and what it becomes. So in this first series, the blastopore becomes the mouth, and in the second series, the blastopore becomes the anus. So which one is protostomes? The first series of images is protostomes. The second series is what? Deuterostomes. Um, and then in our next series of pictures, it says label the pseudocelomate, coelomate, and acelomate organism. Uh, realistically, if you look closely at the picture, I didn't do such a great job editing out the answer, but sometimes that happens even on a test as well. Um, so if you have the information in the picture, use it, right? But let's look at this first one. Um, so it has the digestive tract here, and then it has cavities that are fluid filled that are aligned completely with mesoderm. And then also, it's labeled here. So this first picture is a coelomate or a U coelomate. Um, this next picture, we have the digestive tract, we have a fluid filled space, and then we have one layer of mesoderm lining it, but not the other. It also happens to be labeled pseudocelum, so that is our pseudocelomate. And then the last picture here, we have our digestive tract, um, and then you have mesoderm tissue, and then more mesoderm tissue, so you don't have a fluid-filled cavity. So this is the acelomate. Remember the root word a means without or not, so this one does not have that fluid-filled cavity. That brings us to skeletons. Um, different kinds of organisms have different skeletons. A hydrostatic skeleton, hydro is fluid, right? So this is a fluid-based skeleton. This is typically gonna be found in soft-bodied animals like jellyfish or earthworms. An exoskeleton offers external support, so something like an insect um, or a clam would have an exoskeleton. And then we have an endoskeleton. It's um, typically going to contain mineralized tissue like bone, or cartilage that offers internal support. Remember, endo, inside, exo, outside. Another term that you might hear when you study animals is segmentation. Um, when something's segmented, that means it's made up of repeating units. Um, these repeating units are linked to changes in the Hox genes. Um, and we're segmented, although it might not be obvious um, at first, but if you look at our vertebrae, they're made up of more or less repeating units. Something like a segmented worm or an earthworm um, is going to show pretty clear segmentation. So let's label the types of skeletons found in the different organisms. Um, our first organism up here has um, an exoskeleton. And then is it segmented or not? Is it made up of repeating units? Yes, it is. It has many um, different kinds of, I mean, even just mouth parts and then different um, appendages as well. Next one here, uh, the bird is going to have an endoskeleton, and then is it segmented? Um, yep, it's got vertebrae, it's got a backbone, so that's segmented, and then even if we kind of, I mean, I guess we could kind of talk about the, the feathers as being segmented as well, but mainly the backbone is kind of our key for that there. And then the jellyfish here, um, jellyfish have a hydrostatic skeleton, they're squishy, right? So they have a water-based skeleton. Don't squish them though, you'll get stung. Um, but they are squishy, and then it's a little tricky. Um, generally saying we would not say they're segmented, even though you could kind of argue with me that these tentacles are repeating units. Um, typically when we talk about jellyfish, we would not say that they are segmented though. But that one's a little bit tricky. I won't ask you one like that on the exam. So that brings us to um, two new invertebrate clades that came about by molecular phylogeny. It's always kind of hard to describe something that came about by molecular mechanisms if I give you some sort of identifiable characteristics because they aren't named for, or they aren't 
clumped together because they identifiable characteristics so much as um, similar in similar sequences of DNA and things like that. So that was a struggle to get through, right? <laughs> so the two new invertebrate clades are the Echidozoa and the Lophotrochozoans. Um, so the Echidozoans are named for Echidysis, which is the fancy word for molting. So this picture over here, you can see this organism is molting there. So that would include nematodes, which are round worms, arthropods, which are things like insects, and a few other phyla as well. The Lophotrochozoans are named for um, the lophophore, which are these kind of feeding tentacles here, and a trochophore larval form. Um, this includes things like mollusks and annelids. So that brings us to our first animal phylum, which is the phylum periphera, which is the sponges. Sponges are different than all the other animals because they lack true tissue. They have no apparent symmetry. Um, the adult form is sessile, meaning it, it's stuck in one spot, but they do have free swimming larva. Um, and they can do either sexual or asexual reproduction, which is a little bit different from most other animals, and they are suspension feeders. So if we look at kind of our um, tree here, you can see uh, the peripherans are early divergers. So just another sort of look at the sponges. Um, Remember we had a free-living protist that looks similar to this type of cell. Um, so there's kind of this idea that there was these chanocyte protists that were free-living and then they came together in this colony um, and then eventually we got to something like a sponge. My light just turned out, so one moment. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, the light in the office is on a motion sensor, which is a lot of fun. And apparently I'm not moving enough. So. Sponges are very similar to, um, or some cells in sponges are similar to free living protists. That brings us to our next group of organisms that fall into um, the group radiata. This is the radially symmetrical organisms. It includes the phylum Cnidaria, which is the jellyfish, and the phylum Nidophora, which is the comb jellies. So all these organisms have radial symmetry. Um, they're diploblastic, which means what? two tissue layers, um, and they do have true tissue, and they have a gastrovascular cavity for extracellular digestion, and they have a simple nerve net. So if you look at the cnidarians, um, cnidarians have two different body forms. They have this um, sessile polyp form, where they have this sort of tubular body with tentacles that surround a mouth. Um, and the mouth also serves as an anus because they have only one opening with their digestive system. There's also this more motile form, which is called the medusa form. Um, and this kind of has the umbrella shaped body um, with the mouth on the underside and then these tentacles all around it there. Um, so they have specialized cells that are called um, nidocytes, um, which contain nematocysts that have this like hair-like trigger um, and some of them are sticky and some of them are stinging, um, and that's for um, hunting, basically. And then they have simple muscles and nerves, but they don't have true muscles because true muscles originate, originate from the mesoderm, and these organisms are diploblastic, meaning they don't have mesoderm, they only have endoderm and ectoderm. Um, and the body plane of an Iderian is really just this kind of like sac with a central digestive compartment, which is called that gastrovascular cavity, and it has one opening that functions as both a mouth and an anus. So that brings us to bilatera. Um, so now we are dealing with the bilaterally symmetrical organisms or animals. Um, not we're talking animals, so not or animals, but just animals. Uh, so bilateral have true tissue, they have bilateral symmetry, and this includes the protostomes and the deuterostomes. The protostomes include the lophotrochozoans, the mollusks, um, the annelids, platyhelminthes, um, the bryozoans, brachiopods, rotifers. We're not going to go over bryozoans, brachiopods, and rotifers, though. Um, protostomes also include the echidozoa, which includes nematodes and arthropods. Then we've got deuterostomes, which includes echinodermata, chordata, and hemichordata. We're not going to talk about hemichordata. So the leucotrophozoans have either a lophophore, which is this, you know, tentacle crown here, um, or they have a trochophore swimming larval stage. 
um, which that's the organisms we're going to talk about. So the mollusks, the annelids, and platyhelminthes have that trochophore larval stage. So um, the phylum here that we're dealing with, so we're in, right, true animals, eumetazoa. We're in bilateral, so bilaterally symmetric. We're in protostomia, and then we're in locotrophozoans, and then that gets us to the phylum platyhelminthes. Um, these are flatworms. I remember plat, flat, right? There you go. Um, so these flatworms are very flat. Um, it's a little hard to tell from the picture here. Um, I've got more pictures on the next slide, but it, it's still a little bit hard to tell. But think like a very thin pancake, like a crepe flat. Um, these organisms lack a specialized respiratory or circulatory system. Um, they can use diffusion to do gas exchange, which works well because they're flat, right? Um, diffusion only works well over short distances. If you have a thin body, you keep that a short distance. Um, they're actually predators. They have uh, three tissue layers. They're triple elastic. So the mesoderm is kind of a key evolutionary innovation here, um, but they are AEC limit. Um, I don't care that you memorize the classes of, plat of flatworms or platyhelminthes. However, I just kind of want to introduce you a little bit to um, the diversity of flatworms. This first one here is um, in the class Tubularia. It's um, a planarian. These are kind of interesting. In the past, people used to do um, science experiments in you know, undergraduate or even high school, middle school labs where they um, cut them in half and have them regenerate. Uh, I don't think anybody's really doing that anymore. One of my friends um, teaches a psychology lab, like a behavior lab at a different um, institution, and they actually train their flatworms to go through maze, which is kind of interesting, I would say. Um, we've also got different kinds of flukes. Um, which can have kind of complex life cycles. Um, some flukes have multiple hosts in their life cycle. Um, and then we've also got tapeworms, which is represented down here. Um, this picture here is somebody who got swimmer's itch. Um, if you ever get swimmer's itch, there's a fluke that has a life cycle that includes birds and snails in their life cycle. And um, if you go to a body of water that has a number of snails, you could end up getting this because basically the the flukes have one part of their reproductive cycle and the snail, and then what's supposed to happen for the fluke is that they um, burrow into like the legs of birds. Um, however, in that case, or in this case, in this picture here, um, this is clearly not a bird, that is a human leg. Um, so that person has swimmer's itch there. That brings us to the phylum Mollusca. So again, we're in Eumetazoa, true animals, bilateral, so left and right sides, protostomes, um, locotrophozoa, and then mollusca here. Um, so these guys have a soft body, often with a shell, right? That's a pretty soft body, and that's definitely a shell. Um, they have something called the foot. They have a uh, visceral mass and then a mantle as well. They do have a coelom, so a complete body cavity, but it's confined to a small area around the heart. So here's the heart. Here's the coelom. They have an open circulatory system. Um, they have structures for excretion called metanephridia, and they have this unique radula, which is this kind of scrapey tongue there. Um, don't worry about memorizing the class of mollusks, but I do want to kind of just introduce you to them. Um, so they have um, the polyplacophora, um, which have this kind of plated shell here that's made of chitin um, and poly many like it has many plaques so poly placophora there you've got gastropods gastro is stomach um, pod is foot so the gastropods are like the stomach feet so slugs and snails then you've got bivalves um, so clams and mussels you've got um, cephalopods which I always almost lose this one because it blends in pretty well here but a cephalopod would be like an octopus or a squid or a nautilus here cephalopod means head feet right cephala head pod foot and if you think about an octopus really I mean what is it is a head and a whole bunch of feet so that's a pretty good name too but 
all of these animals here fall into the phylum mollusca or mollusks. That brings us to the phylum annelida, which is the segmented worms. I always feel awkward telling you guys my cheesy memory tricks, but I think it is worthwhile. So annelids are segmented worms, so they're made up of these repeating units, and it has the two ends, so like the segments of the worm. I don't have a better one. If you think of a better one, you go with that. But annelids, segmented worms, this includes the polychaeta, which are marine worms, um, and they have these long setae, which are these extensions here. Um, and then we also have um, like our earthworms and our leeches as uh, segmented worms as well. Um, I think probably many people don't know that a leech is segmented because when you see a leech you're not like looking at it and inspecting for segments you're just probably like get it off me um, but leeches are segmented as well. So that brings us to the echidzozoans which again these are separate from the locotrophozoans um, morphologically and also due to molecular data. Um, they do echidiasis, which is molting, um, and they have a cuticle for both support and protection. Some of them do metamorphosis, um, some of them do not. Um, metamorphosis is like when you go from like a caterpillar to like a butterfly, right? Um, and this includes the nematodes, which are roundworms, and the arthropods, which are things like insects with an exoskeleton and jointed appendages. So roundworms have a collagen cuticle that covers their body. Um, they have longitudinal, so they have muscles the long way, but not the circular way. Um, they have a pseudocelum that acts as a hydrostatic skeleton and also their circulatory system. They do have a complete digestive tract with a mouth, um, and reproduction is usually sexual with separate males and females and they have internal fertilization. There's a large number of roundworm species that are parasitic in humans and other vertebrates like hookworms and pinworms which are probably something you've maybe heard of before. Um, and then there's also um, a roundworm that causes elephantiasis which is elephant-like swelling. Um, so this individual here has that. Um, those worms get into your lymphatic system. The whole point of the lymphatic system is to return your extracellular fluid back to your bloodstream. Um, and so you could see with worms plugging that up how this is such a big problem there. And really it's a horribly unfortunate disease um, because it is treatable, it is preventable, um, but access to healthcare is not the same around the world. And I could really get on a soapbox and talk about that for quite a while. Um, but it's just worth considering how fortunate we are that we have, you know, clean water and access to um, medicine that could treat something like this. So let's review. Uh, which of these are worms? Select all that apply. I think it's easiest um, probably to go through them one by one. If you want to pause to make sure you got it, go ahead. So A, platyhelminthes, what are those? Flatworms. Is a flatworm a worm? Yes. So A is a worm. B, cnidarian, what's that? Jellyfish. Was a jellyfish a worm? No. So B is not a worm. C, nematode. What's a nematode? Roundworm. Is a roundworm a worm? Yes. So, so far we're at A and C. Uh, D, mollusk. What's a mollusk? Like a slug? A uh, squid, snail. Um, is that a worm? No. So then periphera, E, what's that? Sponge? Is a sponge a worm? No. Um, F, annelids. What are annelids? Segmented worms. Is a segmented worm a worm? Yes. So we've got platyhelminthes A, nematode C, and annelid F for that. Uh, which of these are segmented? Platyhelminthes, flatworm, not segmented. Nematode, roundworm, not segmented. Sponge, oh sorry, uh, periphera, sponge, not segmented. Annelid, segmented worm, is segmented. So eight is D. Uh, which of these lacks true tissue? Um, A, jellyfish, does that have tissue? Yes. Sorry, I'm shaking my head. No. Um, <laughs> jellyfish does have tissue. Mollusks, so squid, slug, snail, does that have tissue? Yes. 
Uh, C is periphera. Periphera is a sponge. Does a sponge have tissue? No. So nine, the answer is C. Uh, 10, what is echidiasis? That's the fancy word for molting. So that brings us to the arthropods. Arthropods are arguably a very successful group of organisms, evolutionarily speaking, because three-fourths of all described living species are arthropods. There's a whole ton of arthropods. Um, so arthropods have an exoskeleton that's made of chitin, chitin um, and protein. Who else had chitin? Where have we heard of chitin before? Hmm, cell walls of fungi? Interesting. Um, arthropods are segmented. Um, they have different appendages for movement, food handling, and reproduction. They're cephalized with a head that has well-developed sensory organs um, for sight and touch and smell and hearing and balance. They also have a compound eye and um, a sophisticated brain. I mean, is the brain the same as our brain? No, but it's relatively sophisticated, all things considered. They have an open circulatory system, they have complex gas exchange systems, a complete digestive system, and um, a excretion um, by either metanephridia or mouth piggy and tubules. And we're going to talk more um, in units three and four about different gas exchange systems and different excretory systems and different digestive systems, so don't let that worry you too much at this point. We're just kind of showing you and introducing you to them here. So again, if we look at where we are, we're in Unimatozoa, so true animals, bilatera, um, we're still in protostomes, and we're at arthropods there, which are under Echidozoa as well. That brings us to arthropod subphyla. I'm not worried that you memorize these different subphyla, but it's worth talking about just so you can kind of get an idea. Um, there's the trilobites, uh, Chelicerata, um, Miripoda, Hexapoda, and Crustacea. And we're going to go over each of these in the next couple of slides here. So trilobites are extinct in their early arthro arthropods. You maybe have seen fossils of these before. Um, they have um, three kind of distinct body segments. So that's where the trilobe part of trilobites comes from. The Chelicerata um, are named for their chelicerae, which are their mouth parts. They have four pairs of walking legs, so that's how many legs total? Eight, um, plus these little pedipalps, which are kind of like arms. So these are your spiders. Uh, Myropodia includes the millipedes and centipedes. Um, millipedes are actually herbivorous, um, and centipedes are carnivorous. And millipedes have two pairs of walking leg per body segment. Centipedes have one pair of walking leg per body se segment. Um, don't worry about memorizing that for ex the exam, but maybe it'll help you win like bar trivia sometime if you ever get to go back to that. So still under arthropoda, we've got hexapoda. Hexapods can have wings, which are just outgrowths of their body, but those are pretty important for um, success, right? If you have wings, then you can get away from organisms. You can go to different um, areas that other organisms can't access. Um, you can maybe be a better predator. It really just kind of depends. Um, there's 35 different orders of hexapods with differences in wings and mouth parts, um, and they've got separate sexes with internal um, fertilization. Um, do you know what hexa means? six poda feet so the six feet what do you, what would you call that an insect right so hexapods are your insects um they can either do complete or incomplete metamorphosis with complete metamorphosis you have four stages where the adult and the larval stages look very different so something like um, a caterpillar to a butterfly or an incomplete metamorphosis they have three stages where the young just resemble kind of like little miniature adults that get bigger So still um, in the phylum arthropoda, we've got crustacea or crustaceans. So there's marine, freshwater, and even terrestrial or on-land crustaceans. Um, they have two unique pairs of antenna. They've got mandibles, maxilla, and um, 
maxillopeds and then swimmerettes and there's a cuticle that covers the head and extends past the cephalothorax um, and the larval forms are very different from adult forms. On the next slide we've got more pictures of crustaceans. Um, so here we've got different crustaceans. Um, the pill bug or the roly-poly is the terrestrial crustacean there. That brings us to the deuterostomes. So finally we're getting closer to what you think of when you think of animals. Um, in the deuterostomes you have the echinodermata and chordata. Echinodermata have kind of a modified radial symmetry um, and their larvae are bilateral so they have they don't really follow that symmetry plan very neatly. Um, they do not have cephalization, they do not have a brain, they have a very simple nervous system, they have a water vascular system, there's no excretory organ so they do respiration and excretion by diffusion. Um, they can detach body parts and those body parts will regenerate which is pretty unique uh, characteristic for animals. Um, not entirely unique but Anyhow, and then they do sexual reproduction. Then we've got the phylum chordata, which includes us. Their key distinguishing innovations are the notochord, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, pharyngeal slits, and a postanal tail. And we'll talk about chordates more after we get done with um, echinodermata. So if we look back at our tree here, we've got eumetazoa, we've got bilatera, then you've got deuterostomes, and echinodermata. Um, is the phylum. So echinodermata means spiny skin, if that helps at all. This includes sea stars, brittle stars, sea urchins, feather stars, and sea cucumbers. If you've ever been to one of those aquariums where you can like touch things, you know echinodermata have spiny skin, um, particularly like a sea urchin, right? You do not want to step on those critters. So that brings us to the phylum chordata. So again, eumetazoa clade, bilateral clade, deuterostoma clade, and then chordata or the chordates. Um, there are vertebrate and invertebrate chordates. Um, two invertebrate chordates include the subphylum cephalochordata and the subphylum urochordata. So the cephalochordata are called lancelets. They're marine filter feeders. They're called lancelets because they kind of look a little bit like a sword in a way, like a lance. Um, they do gas exchange across their body surfaces and they're usually sessile but they can burrow and swim. The tunicates um, are animals encased like in a tunic. Um, and the adult is sessile with only pharyngeal slits, and they're the closest living relatives of the vertebrates, and they're filter feeders with two siphons. So if we look at pictures of those, um, here's our lancelets, our cephalochordata. See how it kind of looks like a sword there? Um, they kind of burrow in. And they have the chordate features of the notochord, which is the supportive rod. Um, they have a dorsal, so backside hollow nerve cord. Um, they have a post-anal tail and they have these pharyngeal slits. And then the urochordata are the tunicates. If you look at them, they look kind of like a, a tunic, like a flowy shirt, right? So that's where they get their name from. Um, and in their mature form, they just have the pharyngeal slits. But in their larval form, they have the supporting rod, it's hard to point out, the supporting rod, the notochord, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, um, pharyngeal slits, and a postanal tail. So vertebrates are chordates with a backbone, which probably before we went through however long we've been talking together, you were thinking of animals and thinking of vertebrates. Um, but most animals are not vertebrates as you've seen. So a vertebrate is going to have all of the chordate features and a vertebral column, which replaces the notochord, a cranium, which houses their um, brain, which is the anterior end of the nerve cord. They have an endoskeleton made of either cartilage or bone. They have a neural crust, which is a series of embryonic cells that's found on either side of that neural tube. And those cells can migrate and form many different cell types like neurons and skeletal cells and connective cells. Um, and Vertebrates have a diversity of internal organs, things like livers and kidneys and different kinds of glands and chambered hearts as well. So the cyclostomes or agnathostomes um, are maybe vertebrates that you're not too familiar with. They're jawless vertebrates. 
I always struggle and call them agnathans or, or agnathostomes because that's how I learned them. Um, stome is like mouth, nath is jaw, a is without, so agnathostomes, so they're um, no jaw mouth. Or cyclostomes is what our book calls them, which is another good name, so like circle mouths, right? Because um, look at this mouth. That is a circle mouth for sure there. Um, so there's two classes that our book talks about, the Mixini, which are the hagfish, and the Teramizontidia, which are the lampreys. You may have seen uh, the lamprey in a jar in your lab in Bio 160. You may not have. Sometimes the instructors take it out and sometimes they don't. Um, there's both marine and freshwater versions of these organisms. So, number 11, true or false, all chordates have a backbone. False, not all chordates have a backbone. There are invertebrate chordates. The tunicates and lanceolates are invertebrates. Um, 12, true or false, all chordates have a hinged jaw. That's false as well. We haven't gotten to the ones that have a hinged jaw yet. So, false, not all chordates have a hinged jaw. That does bring us to the nathostomes, though, which are the jawed vertebrates. Um, so jaw mouths, they have hinged jaws that develop from the pharyngeal arches. Um, basically, evolution modified an existing feature to form the jaw. Some gill arches were lost and some were modified. Um, and this is all the rest of the vertebrates that we're going to talk about here. So I do want you to know the vertebrate classes. Um, so all the other organisms, I don't care that you know the classes, but I do want you to know the vertebrate classes. So class chondrichthys, which is your sharks, skates and rays. This is your cartilaginous fish. Chondro is cartilage. Ichthys is fish. So cartilaginous fish have a skeleton of flexible cartilage. Um, this is actually a derived character, meaning um, we believe that they had a bony skeleton first and then later evolved to have a cartilaginous skeleton. Um, and they had these developmental changes that prevented the ossification of the cartilage. Um, Sharks were among the earliest fish to develop teeth, but the teeth are not set into the jaw the same way that our teeth are. Sharks are denser than water, so they have to keep swimming to maintain buoyancy and breathe. They have a dual chambered heart um, with a single atrium and a single ventricle. We'll get into that more in um, unit three and four. They have a lateral line for pressure wave detection. They have a very powerful sense of smell and they um, have internal fertilization. That brings us to the bony fish. They have a bony skeleton instead of a cartilaginous skeleton. They have an operculum that covers their gills. They have a swim bladder for buoyancy. And there's actually two classes of bony fish. So in general, we call the bony fish osteichthys, which is a great name. But um, we break it further down into actinophorygii, which are ray finned fishes. Um, so when you think of something like a goldfish, they have ray fins. Um, and then Sarcoptria GI is your lobe fin fishes. They have these um, thicker, more muscular fins here. Um, I don't care that you know the subclasses of that, um, but this includes the coelacanths and the lungfish, um, which you think, oh, fish don't have lungs, but um, these lungfish can live in oxygen poor freshwater. They have both gills and lungs, and these muscular lobe fins actually allow them to transverse or transverse, like get across land. Traverse? I said it wrong a few times. Traverse is the word I was looking for. That brings us to tetrapods. Tetra is four, pod is foot. So these are nathostomes, things with a jaw and four limbs. So these things typically live on land um, and that transition to land involves adaptations for locomotion, so movement, reproduction, and to prevent drying out. Um, sturdy lobe fin fishes are thought to be, not present day lobe fin fishes, but ancestral lobe fin fishes um, or modern day lobe fin fishes and animals with four limbs share a common ancestor at some point in time. Um, also, the vertebral column had to strengthen and the hip and shoulder bones had to be braced against the backbone. Um, and there's changes in gene expression that make this possible. Again, those hawk gene, hawks genes are important here. This includes amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. So amphibians, amphi means both. In this case, the both is talking about their life cycle. They spend part of their time on land and part of their time 
um, in water. They require water or at least a moist environment to reproduce um, because they have an aqu aquatic larval stage. Um, these organisms have external fertilization. They do buccal pumping to force air into their lungs. Um, so this picture over here shows that, and we'll talk more about that in units three and four, but basically they draw on air through their nostrils and then they close their jaw, um, right? So they like close their jaw, raise their tongue, and that forces the air into their lungs. That's different than how we breathe. Um, their skin can also absorb oxygen and they have a, a three-chambered heart with uh, two atria and one ventricle. They also have metamorphosis, which is regulated by the thyroid. So I don't want you to know the amphibian orders. Um, I just want you to know class amphibia. But I wanted to show you, um, you have anora, which is frogs and toads. You've got caudata, which is salamanders. And then gymnophonia, um, which they look very different. They're kind of interesting. They look kind of like a worm, but they're not a worm. Um, they're secondarily legless, meaning um, they evolved to be legless. Um, so those are just examples of amphibians. So let's match the animal to the correct class. So these are all... Um, chordates. Um, let's start with our bottom left here. Bottom left is going to be chondrichthys. It's a cartilaginous fish. fish. Um, top middle is going to be actinoporygii and bottom right is a super cute amphibian. So that brings us to amniotes, which are tetrapods, so four legs, with an amniotic egg. Um, the amniotic egg is important because it broke the tide of water. The amniotic egg protects the embryo from drying out, um, and it contains an amnion, which is the fluid that protects the embryo, the allantosis, which does gas exchange and removal of waste. It has a yolk sac, has a chorion, and albumin. Often they have a shell. This gets a little weird to think about, but the placenta is really a highly modified shell. Um, and you've probably heard of amniotic fluid before, so if that helps convince you or remind you that the placenta is a really kind of highly modified shell and that placental animals, such as ourselves, are amniotic animals as well. Um, amniotes have other kind of innovations. They have desiccation resistant skin, so they resist drying out. Obviously, there's some extreme environments that um, some animals do better in than others, but generally speaking, they don't dry out as readily, so they can um, kind of break that tide of water. They have thoracic breathing, which I did, I just showed you, right? Uh, so our thoracic cavity expands and that draws air in, unlike the frog who had to bring air into its mouth and then push it into its lungs. Um, we have kidneys that concentrate waste prior to elimination, help conserve water. We have internal fertilization. And traditionally, um, people classified amniotes as reptiles, birds, and mammals. However, birds are now lumped in with reptiles. So be careful on that one. So um, the reason birds are lumped in with reptiles is because they share a common ancestor there. As far as reptiles go, I just want you to know like class reptilia. Um, it's not totally accurate because we're still kind of shuffling things around with reptiles. So I'm going to introduce you to the other kinds of reptiles, but I'm not really going to hold you to them so much. Um, so testudines have a shell here. Um, so you've got turtles, which are aquatic. You've got tortoises, which are terrestrial. And you have terrapins, which can be found in fresh or brackish water. Um, they have this hard protective shell with the ribs fused to the shell. And they don't have teeth, but this one is demonstrating its um, sharp beak there. And obviously some have sharper beaks than others. Um, that brings us to Lepidosauria. Lepis is scale, so this includes your lizards and snakes, which are your squamates, and the Toratora, which are found in New Zealand. Um, they have a jaw with extremely mobile joints. They've got overlapping scales, um, and lizards have movable eyelids and external ears, while snakes do not. Um, another example of a reptile is a crocodile or alligator, which fall into crocodilia. Um, so these guys have a four-chambered heart, they have teeth and sockets, and um, they do some parental care of their young. Um, I'm not going to ask you the difference between alligator or crocodile, but I thought the picture was cute and oftentimes people um, 
people want to know. Obviously, this one did not have orthodontics. They're just saying um, it has different teeth than the crocodile. So that brings us to aves, which are birds, which are part of reptiles now. Um, so when we kind of break off reptiles from birds, people might say non-avian reptile to be like a reptile other than a bird. Um, but birds have feathers, which I think you know. Um, feathers are really kind of modified scales that help keep birds warm and they um, allow birds to fly. Um, they have a very interesting mechanism for breathing where they have air sacs. Um, they have a reduction of organs to kind of shape weight. So if they're female, they have a single ovary and they have no urinary bladder. And they have a lightweight skeleton that's kind of thinner and more honeycombed. It's not hollow like a straw. It's just thinner skeleton, more honeycomb-like. Um, and they have a, a sternum to anchor their flight muscles. And they have a beak and no teeth. So birds also have a warm, warm body temperature. Um, they have a double or double circulation with a four-chambered heart. They have good vision. Um, most birds are carnivorous, although there are some exceptions to that. Most birds take care of their eggs, although there are some exceptions to that. And oftentimes birds have a pretty complex courtship. Um, these pictures here are thermographic images of um, ostrich, and then here's a snake um, eating a mouse. And you can see the ostriches have a warm body temperature and the snake does not have a warm body temperature. That brings us to mammals, which are milk producing amniotes. I picked a bat for this picture because first of all, this bat is super cute. Um, second of all, though, I don't know why, but sometimes students don't think bats are mammals. They are mammals. They fit all the characteristics. Um, maybe they have like a bad reputation or something. They shouldn't really, um, but, but there you go. Don't forget that bats are mammals. Um, so, Mammals evolved from amnio ancestors earlier than birds. They appeared about 225 million years ago. And after the extinction of um, the dinosaurs, the mammals um, really flourished. And there's a whole range of sizes and body forms. Um, a whole variety of organisms are mammals. Um, they have mammary glands that secrete milk. Um, they have hair, right, more or less. Like a dolphin has a different amount of hair than a grizzly bear, um, but they're both still mammals. Um, they're the only vertebrates with specialized teeth. They have an enlarged skull um, to fit their enlarged brain. Um, they have a single lower jaw with three inner ear bones, and they also have external ears, which normally I'd point out, but I'm, I'm wearing headphones, so you're not going to be able to see my ears today. So then in the mammals, there's different subclasses, the subclass Prototheria, um, and then the order Monotremata. The monotremes are the egg-laying mammals. I think oftentimes people get confused on this and don't know that some mammals can lay eggs, but the platypus and the echidna are both egg-laying mammals. These organisms lack a placenta, and they have poorly developed nipples. Now we've got the subclass Theria. Um, so that includes the marsupials, which are in the clade Metatheria. These were once widespread, but now they're mostly found in Australia, although we do have one in North America. We've got the possum. So the young have to um, take a trip to the marsupium to finish development. So they're born pretty immature, and then they crawl into the pouch um, and finish development there. So there's a wallaby and a possum. Now we have the clade Eutheria and the subclass Theria. Um, so you is true. These are the true beasts, the placental mammals. They have a long-lived complex placenta, although what we mean by long-lived obviously varies. Like the gestation period of an elephant and the gestation period of a field mouse are quite different. Um, but in general, these have a prolonged gestation. So... This one you might want to pause and think about, although it's probably going to take me a little bit of time to work through and answer it for you. Um, but go ahead and match the animals to their location on the phylogenetic tree. Um, it is important that you're able to understand and interpret and read a phylogenetic tree for the test. Um, typically, I do questions um, with a phylogenetic tree um, on the exam or at least one question like that. Um, and so to kind of walk you through how to read it, if you see here where we've got this line across, um, like this one says vertebral column, cranium, endoskeleton, that means everything above it, so all of these would have that characteristic. Um, 
but then we have jaws here, so that means that this line would not have jaws, but it would have a vertebral column, cranium, and endoskeleton, but everything else does not. Um, so when you fill this out, I think it's probably easy to start on either the left side or the right side. Uh, for me, we'll go ahead and start on the right side. So hopefully I'm not off screen. Okay, hopefully I'm back on. I think I am. So up here we have something that has all of these characteristics and milk and hair. So who's going to have milk and hair? That's going to be mammal. We'll go in that spot. Um, has an amniotic egg, but no milk and hair. Who has amniotic eggs? Snakes, lizards, turtles, birds. So this one is going to be reptiles. Um, now we have limbs, but no amniotic egg, no milk or hair. That one's going to be amphibians. Um, then we have lobed fins, which is going to be the sarcopter AGI, so two for that one. Bony skeleton lungs or lungs derivatives. Where did that one go? That is going to be six. Um, the actinopter AGI there. Um, having jaws, this group is going to be our chondrichthys. And then this last one is our cyclostomes, Mixini and Teromon, Teromyzon tidia. It's a mouthful. Um, so we have mammals, reptiles, amphibians, sarcopter AGI, actinopter AGI, um, Chondrichthys and Mixini and Teromyzon tidia. So, to kind of go through all the different animals again um, that I want you to know, I want you to know periphera. Periphera are sponges. Um, don't worry about the nidophores. Then I want you to know cnidarians, which are jellyfish. Skip hemichordata. Echinodermata are starfish. Chordata are us, or chordates. Um, Platyhelminthes are your flatworms. Don't worry about rotifers, ectoprocta, brachiopods, but do know the mollusks. Mollusks are squid and snails and slugs. Annelids are your segmented worms. Nematodes are your roundworms. And arthropods are your things with an exoskeleton and jointed legs, like a crustacean or an insect. So then... Um, Let's go down at the base here with our, our words here. So we have metazoa um, and then you metazoa. So you metazoas are true animals here. Um, the sponge is kind of left out on its own. I mean, it's technically an animal, but the word you metazoa is separating everything else from sponges because sponges don't have um, true tissue. So then we have um, bilatera which means that they're bilaterally symmetrical, so they have a left and right side there. Over here, these are radially symmetrical. Um, deuterostomes and protostomes are different, so deuterostomes, that first opening is the anus um, in the blastophore. Then you have the locotrophozoans and the kidsozoas, the kidsozoans, um, which are kidsozoans do echidysis, which is molting, um, and the lophotrochozoans, um, are named for either their crown of tentacles or their larval form there. So then we go into more detail on the chordates. In particular, pay attention to the vertebrates and the classes of vertebrates. Um, Mixini and ter Teromyzon tidia, um, we can lump those together and call them cyclostomes. Um, then we have chondrichthys, which are your, your organisms with a cartilaginous skeleton. Actinophrygii, which are your ray fin fishes, like a goldfish. Um, then you've got the Achinista and Deponi, which are sarcopterygii or lobe fin fishes. And then you've got your tetrapods, which includes amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. So we made it. Um, definitely spend some time memorizing these and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I know that there's a lot of memorization in this first unit. There's memorization in all of the units, but in particular this first unit has a lot. So feel free to reach out if you have questions.